My friends and I grew up in New York in a pretty suburban area ever since 5th grade. Our circle of friends was large back in the day, but the four core members of our group were myself and my three best friends, Johnny, Devin, and Nick. We were 16 years old at the time, and we were having a movie night at Nick's house as his parents had gone up to the Cape for the weekend, so we'd had the house to ourselves. We were at Nick's house as he had to watch over his German Shepherd, Bonzo. When we had arrived, we had helped ourselves to Nick's dad's stock of booze and then played some video games all the way to doing prank calls past 10pm. It sounds childish, but hey, you're only a teen once, right? We get about halfway through the movie when there was an unexpected knock at the door. Nick looked confused and had told us that he wasn't expecting any more visitors. As he requested, I get up and go to the door with him. We thought that maybe we have been making too much noise and that it was his neighbors coming to complain. But that wasn't the case. Standing on the porch was a Domino's pizza delivery guy with a large pizza box in his hands. Hi there, large pepperoni pie paid for online. This was very strange, as we hadn't even thought of ordering pizza. But 16 year olds and pizzas are natural allies so we gladly take it off his hands. I mean, who wouldn't take a free pizza? We tip the guy to be nice and he tells us to have a good night and proceeded to walk away disappearing into the night. The only thing was that there was no vehicle in sight, so we figured that he must have parked a few houses down. We bring in the pizza to the living room and tell the others how we just got lucked out. Devin, being the honest and nice person he was, told us that we shouldn't just eat someone else's pizza. We looked at each other and realized that it was the wrong thing to do, so we leave the pizza on the counter and call up Domino's. Eventually we get through to them and inform them that someone else's pizza had been dropped off at our place and that the delivery guy should take it back to the correct address. They ask for our address and we tell them. The person on the other line asks if we were sure it was a Domino's pizza. Uh, yeah, it's got your logo and everything. At this point, we're all pretty perplexed as no other Domino stores deliver to our area. We decided to give them a few minutes to call us back, and if they didn't, we just ate it ourselves. We fix up a couple of snacks and resume the movie we were watching. I get up to get a glass of soda in the kitchen and was shocked to what I found. Bonzo, the dog, had eaten at least half of the box. Fast forward till about a half hour later. We noticed that Bonzo was becoming really distressed, whimpering and crying, and then heads back into the kitchen. Ten minutes later, we noticed that Bonzo was extremely ill, lying on the floor and having trouble breathing, and we immediately knew that something wasn't right. We looked online for a nearby vet in the area, and there was thankfully one nearby that was still open. Needless to say, we rushed him over there quickly, and he was on the point of death when we brought him in but it wasn't for the reason we expected. The vet said that he was displaying very strange symptoms. They ran a few more tests and what we found really turned our stomachs. There were several traces of strychnine found in his system. It's a very dangerous poison used for killing rodents and it causes all of your organs to shut down completely. Nick's parents came home soon after, and we tried to give the best description to police as to what the delivery guy looked like. Unfortunately, nothing ever became of it, and there were no other reports of anyone receiving a poison pizza. It makes me wonder if the guy specifically targeted us kids as we were young and naive. If that were the case, he had been watching us for god knows how long, and how would he have known that we were by ourselves? Thankfully, Bonzo survived, but had we arrived to the vet even 15 minutes later, he probably wouldn't have made it. If anyone comes to your door with food that you didn't order, do the right thing and check with the company it's from. It may just save your life. There was a Japanese man who had grown tired of his wife. 
When they had gotten married, she was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen, with long black hair, beautiful brown eyes, and soft skin. However, over the years her looks had faded and she had grown fat. Her face had become wrinkled. He realized that he wasn't attracted to her anymore, and he decided to leave her. The man told his wife he wanted a divorce and promptly moved out of the house. He rented an apartment in the city and took to visiting bars and clubs in search of a new romance. It wasn't long until he met a stunningly beautiful young girl. She was only 18 years old, tall and slim, with long flowing blonde hair. He was instantly smitten, and within weeks, he had asked her to marry him. The blonde girl accepted, and after they got married, she moved in with him. However, as soon as the ring was on her finger, the blonde girl's behavior changed. Before the wedding, she had been sweet, pleasant, polite, but now her attitude was hard, mean and rude. She was vain and seemed to spend hours in front of the mirror preening and applying makeup and gazing at her own reflection. She was also very demanding. She made him spend all of his money on her. She forced him into buying her new clothes, new jewelry, new gadgets, and even a new car. One day the man came home and took a good look at his new wife. All of the makeup, the eyeliner, the mascara, the eyeshadow, all of it only hid the ugliness inside. He began to wish that he had never married her. As the years went on, the man started longing for his old wife. She may have been old and overweight, but she had been a caring and considerate person. He cried when he remembered her soft voice, her gentle smile, and her eternal patience. He regretted the day he had divorced her. He gradually realized that he still loved his first wife, loved her more than he could ever love the blonde girl. He began to understand how he had thrown away the only woman who ever truly loved him. Sometimes in his dreams, he would see his old wife sitting alone in her room, her long black hair covering her face, and late at night, he would ask himself how she was living. What was she doing? Would she ever take him back? One night, after a bitter argument, he decided that he couldn't endure any more of his new wife. He couldn't. He decided to leave her. He left the city and made the long journey back to his old wife's house. When he reached the street where they used to live, it was already late at night. The house looked deserted. Tall weeds were growing in the garden, and the windows were cracked and broken. The tiles were missing from the roof, and the walls looked as if they hadn't been painted in years. He knocked on the front door, but no one answered. Then, he tried the handle, and found that the door was not locked. He walked inside and found the rooms empty and silent. A chilly wind was blowing through the broken windows. Going upstairs, he opened the door to the bedroom, and he was startled to find his wife sitting there on the bed. He ran to her, embraced her in his arms, and cried on her shoulder. Through the tears, he told her how much he had missed her over the years, and begged her to forgive him for leaving her. Her face was covered by her long black hair, but he heard her sweet voice whispering in his ear. She told him, I'm glad you came back to me, if only for a moment. Only for a moment, he replied with a laugh. Girl, I'm back for good. Now we can spend the rest of our lives together. He brushed the hair from her face and leaned in to kiss her, but when he opened his eyes, he screamed in terror. Her face was a dirty, moldering skull. <laughs> to his horror, he realized that he had been clutching in his arms nothing but a sack of dusty old bones and long, stringy black hair. The man scrambled to his feet and tossed the bones away from him in disgust. He stood there in the dim light, shuddering as a sickening feeling spread throughout his body. He ran downstairs and out the front door, and on the street, he found a neighbor and demanded to know who lived in the old, broken down and abandoned house. There's no one living in that house now, said the neighbor. Years ago, it belonged to a woman whose husband left her. He divorced her in order to marry another woman. She was so distraught that she killed herself soon afterward. This happened to me May 30th, 2020. My parents were a couple of blocks away from where I lived because they were staying at my aunt's house. My aunt is paranoid schizophrenic, so she has special needs and such. Anyways, it was around 4 a.m. I was a night owl, so I stayed up late playing The Last of Us and drinking soda. I suddenly had the urge to go to the bathroom, so I paused the game and walked into the bathroom and did my business. While I was washing my hands, I heard someone cough from outside of my house, near the gate that leads into my backyard. Since not even a few months ago, my home was invaded. I freaked the hell out. 
and I ran into my dad's bedroom and pulled out the case where he kept his handgun. Since of what happened before, my dad began paranoid and bought a 44 Magnum just in case we had to use it. I wasn't supposed to know about it, but my brother told me since my dad told him. I grabbed a gun and then I hid under my dad's bed as I heard the back screen door open and some noise at the back door. It sounded like he was messing with the back doorknob. I hoped he would fail to get inside and leave, but it seems like nothing can go right for me this year. By the way, I live in Minneapolis. The person somehow got the door open and had entered the house. The back door leads into the basement as I heard the person go downstairs. I then remember my phone in my pocket. I dialed 911. As soon as the operator picked up, I heard the person walk upstairs and walk into the kitchen and began opening and closing all the drawers and cabinets. I didn't feel comfortable talking with the person so close, so I didn't tell the operator what was happening. Then the person entered my dad's bedroom. They flipped the light open and began digging around through some of my dad's files. I identified the person as this big fat man wearing a stained white robe. Then I got an alert on my phone. It was a text from my friend who I was playing video games with asking me what I was doing. I cringed and I clenched my teeth in fear. I asked myself if I was willing to shoot someone. However, I then realized that I had my phone on silent. So it was only a vibration. The man heard something though and began moving the blankets on my dad's bed. I gripped the revolver handle tight as I then saw the man leave the room and move into another part of my house. I got on the phone with the police and explained the situation to the operator and alerted her of suspicions that a KKK member was in my house because there were rumors that the KKK were in our county. The 911 operator suggested that I remain hidden. I then heard the man walk back into the kitchen and then I heard a loud thud. All of a sudden, the police sirens were heard near my house. I heard the man panicking. The man frantically ran back out my back door. I looked through my dad's window and watched the man in the white run and hide in my garage. I went out the front yard and met up with two female police officers and explained everything, including how the man was in my garage. I stayed with one of the officers while the other one went to search my garage. She came back five minutes later saying it was clear and that a window in my garage was open. I called my parents who came back home. The cops left shortly after we filed a report. My dad became paranoid and searched the garage where he found a piece of white cloth underneath his car. I don't know if it was really the KKK, but that was a terrifying experience of my life while in quarantine. My dad has ordered security cameras to prevent any break-in from happening. Just be safe out there. When I was a kid, I spent a lot of time over at my grandparents' house. Both my parents were forced to travel often for their jobs, so I was dropped off at the grandparents' house pretty often. It wasn't as bad as some kids would expect. These were the days of dial-up internet, so being upset about not having Wi-Fi was non-existent. Kids, like myself, played outside during those times. Shocking, I know. This particular story takes place when I was about 9 years old. It was right around Christmas time and they had allowed me to open one present early, without my parents knowing of course. I remember what it was and how I felt as well. It was a brand new pair of binoculars. I was a big fan of bird watching as a kid and still am today but of course I had more time back then. My granddad looked at me and said, I'm going to let you go out into the woods to look for all the critters but be sure not to go past the creek. Being nine, this kind of went in one ear and out the other. I agreed and headed out. The forest behind my granddad's house was massive and he owned it all. I think my dad told me at one point that it was nine or so acres. I as a kid told myself that I had explored it all. Funny how your imagination can run wild like that. Well this day in particular my mind wasn't running rampant. What I saw was real and I knew it judging by my grandparents' reaction. I'd been in the forest for a good ten minutes at this point, just walking as straight as I could looking for any of the critters that ran around out there. I saw a handful of cardinals and chickadees, but nothing super spectacular. Then, I ran across the creek. 
It was completely frozen over, of course, but my mind still wondered about trying to think of what could be on the other side. Why wasn't I allowed over there? Of course, it was for safety reasons. Once you're past the creek a little ways, the house is no longer within seeing or shouting distance. In my mind, however, it was the only place I'd see what I wanted to. I wanted to see a bird I hadn't seen, the less common ones. I looked back at the house a few times, contemplating my decision, and had decided not to go over the threshold and disobey my granddad, but then I heard something on the other side. It was a man's voice. It wasn't scary, I remember. It was warm and inviting, kind of like a good audiobook. I grabbed my attention and, before I knew it, jumped the creek and headed deeper into the woods. I didn't hear that voice again for quite some time and I wasn't seeing any new birds, so I was beginning to think this was a waste of time. I decided to take one more look into the binoculars, do a quick 360, and then head back. The sun was starting to go down and I knew if I was out here much longer I'd get into trouble. I pulled the binoculars to my eyes and took one last look, and I saw it. It wasn't what I was looking for, it was a man. He was tall and wore a fine black suit. He even had a briefcase with him. Judging by how strong the binoculars were, he could have been a little less than half a mile away. He wasn't doing anything, he was just standing there. The longer I looked, the more apparent of how wrong this was came over me. Why would someone in a suit carrying a briefcase be hanging out in the woods in the middle of December? I was so focused I didn't hear my granddad approaching. Soon, he snatched me up and carried me all the way back to his house, scolding me the entire way. Back home, I sat on the couch and he questioned about what I could have seen that made me disobey him. Through my sniffling and eye rubbing, I could only say, I heard a man out there. His demeanor changed completely and I remember hearing my grandpa gasp a little bit. He crouched down beside me and said, What did he say? He just said, Hey, and then he was gone. I didn't see him until I crossed the creek. Nearly whispering, he responded, What did he look like? He had a suit and a briefcase. Are you going to tell my mom? He looked up at my grandmother and then back at me. No, no, we're not, kiddo. Don't worry, we're not mad. We were just worried about you. It wasn't until I was much older that I figured out what I saw in those woods. I was 18 and my granddad was in bad health. He wasn't set to pass any time soon, mind you, but he was just very sick. We were visiting in the hospital and when my parents left to get some food, he told me all about what that man was. Apparently there used to be a cemetery on that land before it became overgrown with trees and vines. That man was a spirit everyone referred to as the Undertaker. According to my granddad, he was a businessman, hence the briefcase, but suffered a heart attack during his wife's funeral. Nowadays, he roams the woods, looking for the grave of his wife. It was a heartbreaking tale. The reason he was so worried about me at the time is because it said that if you're caught by the undertaker, he'll curse you. You'll fall gravely ill and eventually pass away from cardiac arrest like him. I'm not sure how much I believe that story, but I will say that I'm glad he never looked at me. His back was facing me the entire time. My grandma did eventually pass away. Not cardiac arrest, if you're curious, but I have kept the legend strong. I tell everyone I know about it, and if I ever run across kids in that area while visiting the old house, I make sure to tell them, never go past the creek. This happened to me a couple of years ago. It was late May in the evening. I had just finished cleaning up from dinner and it was a nice evening out. I have three big dogs and have to take each of them individually for a walk. My oldest dog is 11 years old and deaf. He is usually the first I walk as he gets tired easily. I grabbed my phone, put my headphones in and headed out the door with my old boxer. I live in a rural area. The houses are quite far apart and set quite far off the road, so I never had to usually worry about running into too many people on my nightly walks. My area is also very safe. Nothing ever happens here. 
I was about 10 minutes into my walk listening to scary stories on YouTube. Yes, I listened to horror stories as I walked my dogs in the dark when I noticed headlights coming up behind me. I didn't pay much attention, just moved closer to the side of the road, pulled my dog over onto the dirt to stay off the road as a car went by. I kept walking and noticed that even though I saw headlights from behind me, they weren't going past me. I'm female, 35 years old, about 5 foot 4, blonde hair that was up in a ponytail. I had a feeling that I should turn around, and when I did I saw a pickup truck with two people inside pulled off on the side of the road, about 15 feet behind me. I could make out the silhouette of the driver and the passenger, but not their faces. I kept walking thinking they had just pulled over for some reason that had nothing to do with me. Well, I was wrong. About 30 seconds after I turned around to look at the truck, it started slowly creeping along the road behind me. I was getting a little freaked out, but tried to play it off like I didn't care what they were doing and kept on my walk. Please keep in mind my dog is very old and would be of little help to me if these people were to get out of their truck. I started walking a little faster and the truck kept following behind me. About a minute later I decided to turn around and started heading back to my house so I had to walk past the truck. As I turned around, they stopped in the road and didn't move. I was going into full panic mode at this point so I pulled my phone out to call my husband. As I was dialing his number the truck started honking its horn at me and the driver rolled down the window and said, Hey, we're lost, can you help us? I ignored them and kept walking, praying my husband would answer the phone. He was still at work and didn't pick up so I started walking faster. The truck then did a complete turn in the middle of the road, turned its high beams on me and sat there revving its engine over and over. The sound of this made me start running with my old dog who has a hard time walking quickly as it is. I'm running with my dog, the truck still sitting revving the engine. Then all of a sudden it takes off towards me. My heart is pounding in my ears and the fear and panic I felt in that moment. Indescribable. I can hear the truck flying down the road towards me and they're now honking their horn over and over again. I was still at least five minutes from my house and between me holding on to my dog and running, I dropped my phone somewhere in the dirt on the side of the road. I kept running as fast as I could with my dog, turned my head to see that they were heading straight at me from the road. I grabbed my dog and jumped down into the ditch to narrowly avoid being hit. The truck kept honking as it drove down the road past me and kept on going. I truly thought I was going to end up kidnapped or dead from them hitting me. I was so terrified I pulled my dog into the woods for at least 15 minutes to make sure the truck didn't come back. I finally made it home, absolutely terrified, called my husband from my landline. He was almost home so when I told him what happened, he was very sorry that he didn't pick up when I had called him. I did phone the police when my husband got home. They came out and took a report. I gave them a description of the truck and the man, but they didn't end up finding who they were. Just a word of advice. Don't walk along dark country roads at night with an old dog and always carry pepper spray or something with you to protect yourself. I never thought something like that would happen to me that close to home. I'm really close with my best friend and her family. I mean, we have known each other since we were two and we lived on the same street even till this day. Since we have known each other for so long and we have a lot of stories to share, but today I thought to share this one. When we were eight, she invited me to go camping at a local campground for the weekend and I desperately wanted to leave my house, so I accepted. When we first got there at around 10 p.m., we thought it would be fun to scare some people by hiding in the bushes and jumping out. It was fun and we got a few people and some of them just chuckled and thought we were cute and kept walking. And then we jumped out at this one man and... His reaction startled eight-year-old me because, when we jumped out, he didn't get scared. He just looked at us and smiled this really gross, pervy old man smile. 
Since it was a couple of years ago, and it was dark and I couldn't really see any distinct features other than he seemed to be a white male in his late forties, around six foot, medium build and had a strong smell of cigarettes and whiskey, my friend, we'll call her Faith, and I were both kind of weirded out because he didn't say anything for a couple of seconds until he said, You know, you really shouldn't scare people like that, it's quite naughty. That scared me just because the whole time he was still smiling and staring at us all over. I was frozen and Faith just grabbed my arm and said sorry to the man and we ran off. The next day was normal, but when it was sunset, we wanted to run around the campsite and be kids. When we were running around, we heard someone yell, yoo -hoo! from up the hill and so we look up and see no one, so I, without thinking back, yelled, yoo -hoo! And then we see someone walk towards us on the hill. You guessed it. It was the man from the night before. I wasn't scared this time. I was in such a good mood, so I let the guy come towards us, and he yells down to us. Where are your parents? Which Faith replies. Oh, they're at the campsite. When he hears that, the grin comes back, and he asks. Well, it's getting dark, so why don't I walk you back? We started to get creeped out and said, Nah, it's okay, it's pretty far away. Which he responds with, Oh well, I have two kids and they have bikes you can borrow up at my campsite. Why don't you come with me and I'll show you. I was scared and all I wanted to do was go back, but I didn't want to hurt his feelings, being as naive as I was. So I accepted and Faith and I started to walk up behind the man with him, as he looked back every few seconds with that grin to make sure we were still following. After about 30 seconds, we got to his campsite, and we looked around and saw no trace of kids, let alone bikes. This was a huge red flag. He says to wait outside of his trailer while he gets something. I look at Faith and tell her that we have to hide since there's no way we can run back to our parents fast enough, so we book it to the bushes. After about a minute, I see him swing open the trailer door and come outside with not bikes, but duct tape. This sight chilled me to the bone. Even though I was young, my mom and dad have told me about all the scary things that have happened to kids when they wander away. I would always watch murder shows with my dad and had seen an episode when someone was tied up with duct tape. I started to freak out when I see his face change from that disgusting grin to pure anger. He looks around, even right past me and Faith crouched down in a bush after no luck he charges back inside, and I grab Faith and we both run all the way back. We were too scared to tell our parents, so we just went straight to bed. We went home the next day and didn't talk about it until a couple of days ago when it popped in my head. Nothing came from this experience other than years of nightmares. Recently, we all know what has been going on around the world, the coronavirus. Well, this story took place on April 3rd, 2020. I live in Akron, Ohio with my mother. My mother is a nurse and she works in Cleveland Clinic Hospital at night, five days a week. On this day, my mother went to work at 8 p.m., so I was there by myself. I'm 17, so I'm more than capable to stay home. I decided to make myself some dinner right after my mother left because she told me to fend for myself. By 9 o'clock, I was getting ready to sit down to eat when I heard a knock at the door. I looked at my phone and double-checked the time, and sure enough, it was 9.04 p.m. I thought it was weird being that it was so late. I looked through the peephole, and it was some random guy I'd never seen before. I asked him what he wanted, and he asked me if Gigi was home. I told him that no Gigi lives here. He then said, oh, and then asked me if I was sure. I said I'm positive. He took out a picture and put it up to the peephole and told me that it was Gigi in the picture. At this point, I should have told him again that she's not here, but I didn't. I told him that I can't see it through the peephole and he proceeded to tell me that I should open the door so that he can show me the picture. I told him that I don't know about that due to the quarantine. He kept asking me, so I said, fine. I grabbed my mask and opened the door, but I kept my chain on. But as I was opening the door, I swear this guy slightly pushed it. Then he looked surprised when it didn't open. I asked him what he was doing, and he said, my bad. 
I tripped. I said, no, you didn't. You weren't even moving, and I slammed the door. I looked back through the peephole, and he took off running. I kept looking outside for about 20 minutes just in case he tried to come back. So now an hour went by, and as soon as I stopped thinking about that creepy guy, there was another knock at the door. Again, I looked at the time, and it said 10.32 p.m. I looked through the peephole, and there was a young woman with a white dress with dark hair over her face just standing there. I can barely see her face due to her hair, but it looked like she had dried up tears. I asked, what do you want? She said, we are. Then she stopped mid-sentence and looked behind her, then corrected herself in a very monotone voice. I'm from a group that's testing people in your area for the coronavirus. Can you let me in to test you? It's very important to get tested. I don't think she noticed the peephole on my door. She looked behind her again and whispered to someone, but I couldn't see who it was. Then I saw the same guy from earlier walk from behind her and headed to my backyard. I ran to my back door to make sure it was locked, looked outside, but I didn't see him. I ran back to the front door and looked back through the peephole, and the girl was just standing there staring at the door, not moving, not even blinking. Then I heard someone messing with my back door. It was the guy from earlier along with another guy. I screamed that I'm calling the cops, then I heard them run away, then I could see them out my side window running. I looked back in the front and I saw them dragging the woman away. It looked like she didn't want to go with them. The police came over and insisted that it was a prank. Since then, I purchased a gun from a guy that lived around the corner from me, and I'm ready for anything now. The following happened when I was on a school French history trip to France and Belgium back in 2014, which, incidentally, was the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. However, the paranormal events which occurred in this short trip had nothing to do with the many mass grave sites and historical locations we visited. In fact, they all occurred in the first, basic and cheap hotel we stayed in for the first two nights. The hotel, which I have since forgotten the name of, was bordering on a hostel. It was six of us to a room and three bunk beds and I was sharing one with my closest friends. I also knew the other boys fairly well. I remember that on the first day we had been awake for well over 24 hours so upon arriving at the hotel we didn't pay much attention to how it looked. However, we found it surprisingly hard to get to sleep immediately. The first strange occurrence happened while everyone was casually chatting as we lay in bed, probably at around 11 at night. Each bottom bunk had a light underneath it and they were all controlled from one central wall switch over by the door. I should mention that we had all these lights off as we were meant to be asleep. However, in the middle of our conversation, one of the lights suddenly turned on. It stopped our conversation dead and we were all slightly confused. This happened several more times with lights going on and off under the bunks while the wall switch didn't move. Everyone was getting visibly spooked at this point, however one of the boys had found a second switch beside his bed and we soon realized that every bunk had these to control the three lights. With everyone relaxed again, our 14 year old imaginations calmed down significantly and everyone began to nod off one by one. Later in the night, at what I estimate was about 1 in the morning, I was still half awake. I have always been a very light sleeper. I was listening to the deep breathing of everyone in the room when I heard an audible click. I turned around and saw the light to the walk-in shower was on. I assumed that someone had walked in to play a prank, but after quickly scanning my eyes about the room, I could see that everyone was in bed. I was confused, but not frightened yet. Shortly after the shower turned on seemingly by itself, I again turned over to face the walk-in shower. Sure enough, through the crack in the door I could see the shower water running. I turned away quickly and lay there for hours, unnerved before falling asleep. The next morning was busy, visiting several historical sites and it wasn't until lunchtime in a cafe that a few of us brought up the night before. Several others testified to being awake when the light and shower turned on. We were all slightly unnerved but it wasn't until the next night that things really kicked off. On the second night, everyone fell asleep very quickly, but as per usual, I couldn't sleep. 
I lay awake slightly nervous and the main light of the room went on and off at intervals of around 10 minutes for around an hour. Then at around 2 in the morning I heard a huge crash and looked around to see that the shower door had swung open completely hitting the wall. The light was on and shower running. I was terrified. I turned to face the wall and didn't open my eyes till the next morning. The next day we moved to a different hotel and the subject of the hotel being haunted was only brought up once more during the trip. Although this is one of the smaller experiences I've had regarding the paranormal, it sticks with me due to how unexpected it was. We found out that the original owner of the hotel had died from cancer but I saw no evidence or reason that whatever caused the disturbance was her ghost or spirit. It is an experience that will always stick with me as being strange and spooky. I'm 18 now, but when I was in 7th grade I was at my friend's house staying the night. He lived in a pretty rough side of town, but we were too ignorant to any danger. Around midnight we decided to walk to a gas station about 2 miles from his house, just to have something to do. We always like to freak each other out on these little late night walks, so I told him we should walk through the forest on the way to the gas station. With no hesitation, he made a sharp turn and walked directly into the trees. I followed and we began to try and make each other fearful as we would ask, Did you hear that? Obviously nothing was there until one time we weren't talking and heard a loud snap, like someone stepping on a branch. Instantly we stopped and looked at each other, then began to bust out laughing because how scared we got. We continued walking and eventually got out of the trees to the dimly lit street. I live in a small town so there was only a small hotel and a bar in front of us. We continued walking when all of a sudden my friend nudged me, asked me if I had noticed the person behind us. Once again thinking he was trying to scare me, I told him to shut up, but when he looked at me I could tell he wasn't kidding. I glanced over my shoulder and he wasn't kidding. There was a person about 50 feet behind us. It was too dark and they were too far away to see any features, but the silhouette was definitely there. I whispered to my friend that we should go to that hotel and to not look back again. We eventually stepped into the light coming from the sign of the hotel and checked. Sure as shit it was still behind us. We looked at each other and made the decision that we should get to that gas station and fast. We continued walking and I glanced over my shoulder. The person had walked into the hotel and we were now alone. I called my friend a pussy and we laughed as we were reaching the gas station. Inside we bought some drinks, laughed off the situation, and decided we should keep walking to our other friend's house, about a mile away. We began walking when I felt like someone was following us. I turned around and that's when I saw it. The same person had somehow caught up, was only 10 feet behind us, this time fully lit up. A tall lanky figure draped in brown clothes loomed over us. My eyes crept up and that's when I realized there was no face, no eyes, no nose, no mouth, nothing. Just a faceless person. We both dropped our drinks and bolted to the nearest public place. Thankfully we saw some cop cars and ran to them. We stopped and looked back. The person had now crossed the street, but its head was fixed on us. The body sideways, but the head still looking at us. The creature walked straight into the trees like we had done so earlier. And as fast as it started, it was over. Day 10 of Self-Quarantine I live in an apartment in New York City. New York City has been hit harder than any other state in the US. I live alone and was watching TV at 2am last night. I noticed a strange sound at my door. It was a scratching sound followed by a meow like cat sound. What the fuck is going on? I get up off the couch and crept slowly and silently to my door. The scratching sound continued. I looked out my peephole and didn't see anything. I was more than concerned at this point. 
I walked back to my kitchen area to get some water before I went to sleep. My apartment is a very small studio style apartment. I essentially live in one large room with all of my amenities close at hand. When my head finally hit my pillow, a knock at the door came once more. I about jumped out of my skin. I approached my door with my handgun and peeped out the hole once more. I saw a man on all fours licking his hand like a cat. I yelled through the door that I was armed. That would-be intruder stood up slowly, placed his large knife directly against my door's peephole. I figured I would catch him off guard, and I had only milliseconds to react. I drew my gun and pulled the door open in a flash. He took a step back. We locked eyes in that moment, and he meowed at me and winked. He slowly walked down the long hallway and vanished. I am still to this day asking what the fuck that was. I walked the length of the hallway to make sure he had exited the building. Never saw him again. I walked back to my apartment door and somehow ended up locked out. My door never locks when it closes. Maybe in the madness I accidentally locked it. I'm without a key to my apartment, and I just heard heavy footsteps coming up from full staircases on my floor. I'm outside in the hall with my gun and boxers. Should be an interesting night. So when I was in my first year in high school, I had a teacher whose name was Dr. Johansson. He used to teach my class civics. He was a special fellow, not like other teachers. In the school I attended, teachers were often not close to students in a social way. They were simply there to teach, and that only. Dr. Johansson liked to keep contact with the students, so he decided it would be a lot easier to do so if he had a Facebook account. He started adding people on Facebook from our school, and eventually started talking to them. He often posted weird stuff on his wall, and commented weird things. For example, one time he posted the song, Straight Outta Compton by N.W.A., and wrote, all they say is the n-word, 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 n-word. I don't get it. Of course, some students commented and asked him why he had used the n-word so freely. He removed the post and apologized, blamed it on being drunk. And this was nothing. He started talking to students, mostly boys, and he managed to find some students' numbers and started sending them texts randomly. He would send stuff like, Do you need help with homework? You could come over to my place and I could help you out over a glass of wine. And this he would say to teens that were younger than 18 years old. So according to the law, they are not even allowed to drink. And he pretty much offered alcohol to minors. Remember, he's a civics teacher. He should know this stuff by heart. It's also morals for God's sakes. Anyway, he never sent me a text. But he sent some weird texts to my friends. Later on, he decided to talk to me. This was a couple of weeks after he had started contacting students like this. He would speak to me on Facebook chat. He would ask me things like, How do you get girls? Do you have a big dick? Do you often get to sleep with girls after your shows? Because I'm an artist. And I found these messages highly disturbing. They became worse. Like, You must be such a stallion in bed. You were probably really good. And, Enter the rabbit hole with me. Come on. I'll take care of you. I had no clue what the fuck that meant. And that wasn't even everything. After a while, things started to get out of control. He started asking me to go out with him to the clubs. And I wasn't even of age at the time. And he said he could get me into the clubs with no ID and all would be well. Now, of course, I said no. He then apparently got pissed at me and decided not to speak to me much after that since I had turned him down a few times. He started talking to one of my nearest friends instead. It ended up with Dr. Johansson sending my friend a picture of his ass with the caption, Please, take me from behind and take me hard. Mind you, my friend was 17 at the time whilst Dr. Johnson was around his mid-30s. He was taken to court and Dr. Johansson got his little sentence. He was to do community service for a little while and then he was to pay my friend a fine. That was it. Dr. Johansson still works at a school today and is totally accepted. I find that very wrong, people. Very wrong.
A man like that should not be able to get into that line of work again. Things could have gotten much, much worse. This encounter happened to me just recently about a month ago, before the global pandemic. I'm a 20-year-old female and I was working the night shift at my local Papa John's with my two co-workers, Vicky and Carl, and we were getting ready to close up shop for the night. I was pretty bummed having to work the night shift, but it was only one night and my manager agreed to pay me overtime and an extra day off. Anyway, I told Vicky to clean off the tables and that I would clean the windows as these were our main duties for closing. I'm cleaning the windows when I notice a man in his mid-forties out in the parking lot ranting on about something on the phone. He was wearing a shirt that used to be white but was now clearly yellow and brown, along with a Yankees baseball cap. The Papa John's was located in a not-so-great area of town, so we were used to seeing people like this every now and then. I paid no attention to him and continued cleaning the windows when I suddenly see him approaching the front door. We had already locked all of our doors and were 20 minutes away from closing, so I politely told him that we were closed and that he had to come back tomorrow. Can I just come in to use the restroom? I'll be real quick. As much as I wanted to let him in, I told him no once again and that there was a 24-hour gas station just down the road and that he could try there. He then stared at me with an empty pale look on his face, which then began to form into a frown. In my opinion, it was the type of look a toddler gives their parent when they can't have a toy. And coming from someone this age, it's much more disturbing. He then slowly walked away, disappearing into the night. After a while, I didn't see the man anywhere, so I figured he must have left, which I found relieving, as I don't like dealing with customers like that. Ten minutes go by, and I remembered that I had to take the trash out and replace the bags. I grabbed the two heavy garbage bags and started heading out, but Steve, our delivery guy, had just gotten back from his last delivery and offered to take the trash out for me. I gladly accepted and he did just that. But when he came back in, he looked so petrified and stiff as a board. His face was pale and his eyes were wild. Being the good friend I was to Steve, I asked what was wrong and he told me to come behind the counter. What he told me sent shivers up my spine. That guy who wanted to come in earlier was crouched down by the dumpster waiting for you with a roll of duct tape. I told Steve to call the police while I informed my manager about the situation. He told us to close all doors and call the cops immediately. The nearest police station was about five minutes away so they came within a couple of minutes. However, just like in most situations like this, the man wasn't there. He must have been waiting for me this whole time to take out the trash so that he could do god knows what to me. The next day, my manager swore to me that I would never work another night shift again. I still work there till this day and nothing has happened since and Steve always drives me home from work after our shifts. I am forever grateful that Steve was there that night, but I still wonder what would have happened to me had I had been the one who took the trash out that night. I'm 15 years old and I prefer my full name was not revealed, but my name is Luke. This happened to me about two weeks ago while I was quarantined because of the coronavirus. Since there has been no school, I've been able to stay home a lot more. On a Friday night, my parents went to go visit my older brother who is 25 in the city to check on him while I stayed at home because I wasn't feeling well. At around 10 o'clock, my mom texted me that they would be staying the night at my brother's house and would be back in the morning. I started to feel better and stayed up late a couple more hours playing video games. Then I heard my backyard gate open. My window was right by the backyard, but I thought it could have been my dad. But then I heard a voice I didn't recognize by my window. I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I immediately got scared. I started searching for my phone, but I couldn't find it. And since we didn't have a house phone, my iPhone was the only way to contact my parents. I started hearing pounding on my back door, which gave me goosebumps. I turned off my computer and crawled under my bed. 
I heard three more pounds on the door until it finally burst open. And I heard the intruders enter my house. I knew I had to arm myself in case they found me. So I grabbed a screwdriver by my nightstand. As I did this, I heard the voices of three men speaking Spanish. As I went to crawl back under my bed, I knocked down on my book on my dresser and it made a loud thud. Then I heard more Spanish and someone walking. They were walking towards my bedroom. I hid under my bed. As I saw someone enter my room, I was afraid. I covered my mouth as I watched the figures search around my room for about 30 seconds until giving up and leaving. Put my ear down to the floor and I heard rustling going on in the basement and loud yells in Spanish as if two men were arguing. I then finally found my phone on the floor under my sweatshirt and informed the police of my situation and whispered as much as I could. I asked the operator if I should run, but the lady told me to stay hidden. In like five minutes, I heard the police sirens move toward my house and the three Spanish men began scurrying up the stairs. I heard all of them exit the back door and towards the back gate. After hearing that, I hung up and got from under the bed and went towards the living room. As I heard an officer knocking on the door calling out police, I ran towards the door until from behind I was tackled by someone. I let out a scream as someone's hand covered my mouth and began choking me with their arm. The officer kicked down the front door and aimed his gun at me and yelled at the man choking me to let me go. The man let me go and I almost threw up. Another officer entered and escorted me outside where I explained everything. The officer from earlier brought in the guy who choked me. He had a black goatee and tattoos all over his neck. He cursed me out and told me that if the cops didn't show up, he would have killed me. I finally called my parents, who came home in less than an hour, where the officer explained to my dad that they entered the backyard because the back gate was not locked. And they bust through my door because I didn't use the chain lock. As the police checked out the house, they saw that the kitchen and basement pantry had been raided, along with some valuables, like some of my mom's jewelry. Unfortunately, the two other men still have not been caught, and I haven't heard anything since. I spoke with my dad afterwards, and he believed that they were stealing food because of the virus. But the part that puzzled me is why they would rob houses if people were at home. My dad has become a lot more paranoid since that situation locking every door, and is set to installing security alarms and cameras. And I'm very glad that he did that, because I'm afraid that the one guy who was arrested will come back and fulfill his wish to kill me.